So this morning I would like to use as a subject Paul's letter to American Christians. Paul's letter to American Christians. I would like to share with you an imaginary letter from the pen of the Apostle Paul, the postmark reveals that it comes from the island of Crete. And after noticing and opening the letter, I discovered that it was written in ill-formed, sprawling Greek. And at the top of the letter was this request. Read to the people when they assemble themselves together and pass on to the other churches. I have labored with the translation for several days. At times it has been difficult, but now I think I have its substance. And if in giving this letter the content sounds strangely Kingian rather than Paulinian, attributed to my lack of objectivity rather than Paul's lack of clarity, it is quite miraculous indeed that the Apostle Paul should be writing a letter to you and me 1900 years after his last letter appeared in the New Testament. How that is possible I do not know and I do not really care. The important thing is that I can imagine Paul speaking to us in 1956, speaking to American Christians, and here is the letter as it stands before me. I, an apostle of Jesus Christ, through the will of God, to you who are in America, grace and peace be unto you through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I had longed to be able to come to see you. I have heard of you and what you are doing. I have heard of the fascinating and astounding advances that you have made in the scientific and the material realms. I have heard of your aeroplanes, and I have heard about the fact that through your scientific genius, you have been able to dwarf distance and place time in change. Yes, you have been able to carve highways through the stratosphere. And so in your world, you have made it possible to eat breakfast in London, England, and lunch in New York City. I have heard about your skyscraping buildings with that towers steeping heavenward as if to bathe their peaks in the lofty blue. I have heard of your great medical science and all of your advances in the medical realm. And so you have been able to cure many dread plagues and diseases and thereby to prolong your life and bring about greater security and physical well-being. All of that is wonderful. You can do things now that could not be done in the Greek or Roman world of my day you can make journeys now in one day that it took me three months to make. 
That is wonderful. You have gone a long, long way in material advances. But America, I am wondering, as I look at you from afar, whether or not you have gone as far in the spiritual and moral realm. It seems to me, America, that although you have advanced scientifically and materially, you lag behind spiritually and morally. Your court Thoreau used to talk about improved means to an unimproved end. And how often that is true, you have allowed the material means by which you live to outdistance the spiritual ends for which you live. You have allowed your mentality to outrun your morality. You have allowed your civilization to outdistance your culture. Yes, America, you go very high in the spiritual realm, I mean in the material realm. But how far have you gone in the moral realm? Through your scientific genius, you have been able to make of the world a neighborhood. But through your moral and spiritual genius, you have failed to make of it a brotherhood. And what does it profit a man? As that same Lord said, that same Lord that met me on the Damascus road, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world of means, aeroplanes, subways, and all the skyscraping buildings and lose the end, the soul? And so America, I would urge you to seek to bring your spiritual advances up to your material advances. I am impelled also to write you concerning the tremendous responsibilities confronting Christians attempting to live in a sub-Christian age. Yes, I had to do that, for I had to live in an unchristian world. And every Christian has a basic responsibility to live a Christian in an unchristian world. They tell me that there are some among you, even in the churches, who give their ultimate allegiance to the patterns of the world. They want to be accepted socially. They are not afraid to be ostracized. And so they conform to the patterns of the world. They live by some such philosophy as this. Everybody is doing it, so it must be all right. And so, so often in your age, right has become merely something of taking a gallop poll of the majority opinion. How many are living like that? How many people are giving their ultimate allegiance to this way? But America, may I say to you, as I said to the Roman church, be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And may I also say to you that you have a dual citizenry. You have a twofold citizenry. You are not only a citizen of this world, but you are a citizen of another world. You live both in time and eternity, both in heaven and earth. And you must come to see that although it is true that you live now in the colony of time, you must always take your orders from the empire of eternity. You must come to see that, America, that your ultimate allegiance is not to the government, not to the state, not to the nation, but your ultimate allegiance is to God and sometimes it's necessary to be, to speak out against the state in order to stand up with God. Oh, America, will you come to see this? But not only that, America, I have read some of your psychology. And I hear you talking a great deal about maladjustment. It is the ringing cry of the child psychologist, maladjusted. And certainly nobody wants to be maladjusted. Everybody wants to be adjusted. 
But America, I want to call upon you, if you're going to be followers of Christ, to be maladjusted. I never intend, America, to adjust myself to some things, and I hope you will never adjust to it. In an age amazingly adjusted to war, I call upon you to be maladjusted. In an age amazingly adjusted to imperialism and colonialism, I call upon you to be maladjusted. In an age amazingly adjusted to hate and malice, I call upon you to be maladjusted. My plea to you in America is to be maladjusted. I understand that you have a great economic system in America that you call capitalism. And through that economic system, you have been able to do wonders. You have been able to build up the richest nation in the world. And through that system, you have been able to build up the greatest productive system that the world has ever known. And all of that's fine. But America, that is a danger that you will misuse your capitalism. I'm not an economist and I cannot criticize your economic system from the point of view of the economist, but I can criticize it from a moral point of view. And I still contend, America, that money can be the root of all evil, that money can lead one to live a life of gross materialism. And I'm worried that too many people in America are more concerned about making a living than making a life. Yes, America, money can lead to exploitation, and so often you have done that, for they tell me that one-tenth of one percent of the population controls more than 50 percent of the wealth. Oh, America, how you've taken necessities from the masses to give luxuries to the classes. Your capitalism can be used very well. You can use it to wipe poverty from the face of the earth. You can use it to lift the whole level of humanity. You can lift it to make mankind come to the point that it is destined to come to. Your wealth can be used to a noble end. You have it at your disposal. Use it for that, America. Oh, I would that I could be with you. I would that I could say to you face to face what I am trying to say to you in writing, how I long to be with you. But let me rush on and say something about the church. I must say to you once more, as I have said so often before, that the church is the body of Christ. And in the body of Christ there can be no division. In the body of Christ there can be no disunity. But I am disturbed about America and what is happening there concerning the body of Christ. They tell me that in America you have within Protestantism more than 256 denominations. And the tragedy, America, is not so much uh, that you have more than 256 denominations, but the fact that all of these denominations are warring against each other and trying to make it appear that they have the only truth. And oh, this narrow sectarianism, this narrow denominationalism is destroying the unity of the church America, you must come to see that God is not a Baptist, that God is not a Methodist, that God is not an Episcopalian. God is bigger than any of our denominations. You must come to see, America, that all of this is man-made. But even as I look at Roman Catholicism, I'm disturbed about that because it stands out also with an arrogance which becomes a spiritual arrogance, making the world appear that it has the only truth, standing with its noble Pope, almost taking the place of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so when he speaks ex cathedra, he becomes infallible. I'm disturbed about any earthly creation that tends to claim infallibility. I'm disturbed about any church that refuses to cooperate with other churches with the pretense that it is the only true church. That is so much in the church that is destroying the body of Christ. And in the body of Christ, there can be no division and no disunity. But America, another thing disturbs me about your church. You have a Negro church and you have a white church. Oh, America, that is quite disturbing for that cannot exist 
within the true body of Christ. How did that thing ever get into being anyway? You have allowed segregation to come into the church America. Oh, how tragic. When you stand up on Sunday morning to sing, In Christ there is no east or west, isn't it tragic that you stand in the most segregated hour of your Christian nation? They tell me there is more integration in sports arenas and nightclubs than that is in the Christian church. Oh, how tragic that is. How appalling that is. They tell me that there are even Christians among you who try to justify segregation on the basis of the Bible. They try to argue that the Negro is inferior by nature because of Noah's curse upon the children of Ham. Oh, my friends, all oh, America, this is blasphemy. This is against everything that the Christian religion stands for. This is against the will of the Almighty God. In America, I would urge you to get rid of that something called segregation. It is a dangerous evil. It is an evil which must be wiped over the face of the earth if man is ever to come to his full maturity. America, don't compromise with it. Don't play with it. Oh, I praise your Supreme Court for passing a great decision just a year or two ago. And I praise all men in your nation of goodwill who are willing to follow it. But they tell me you still have some brothers among you in Alabama and Mississippi and Georgia and Louisiana and Florida who would make their legislative halls ring loud with the words interposition and nullification, they have lost the true meaning of democracy and Christianity. And I would urge you to plead with your brothers with patience and understanding goodwill and tell them that this isn't the way. May I say just a word to those of you who are struggling against this evil. Let me say to you to always struggle against it with Christian methods and with Christian weapons. Never succumb to the temptation of becoming bitter. Never succumb to the temptation of indulging in hate campaigns. You must at all moments move with wise restraint and calm reasonableness. Keep pressing on but press on with discipline and dignity and use only the weapon of love and let no man pull you so low as to hate him. Look at your oppressor hard enough to see in him something of God's image. Yes, it might be just a spark, but if you work on him long enough, it can develop into a leaping flame. And so I would say to those of you who are warring and struggling against your oppressor to use Christian methods and Christian weapons and let him know that as you struggle, you are not attempting to defeat him, not attempting to humiliate him, not attempting to get rid of, uh, get rid of him or uh, to pay him back. Let him know that you are seeking to help him as well as yourself. Let him know that the festering sword of segregation debilitates the white man as well as the Negro. Let him know that as you seek to rid the earth of this evil of segregation, you are seeking to help him also. Give that message all over the world and live by that principle and get rid of that something called segregation, America, for it is not only rationally inexplicable, but it is morally scandalous. You must get rid of it if you are to be a Christian nation. Yes, America, I realize that some of you will give your lives to this something. There will be white people of goodwill who will do it, and there will be Negroes who will struggle to get rid of it. But I want to say this to you, that as you struggle, don't despair. Realize that whenever you stand up for right and righteousness, whenever you stand up for truth, whenever you stand up for goodness, you will be persecuted, but don't despair about it. Sometimes it might mean going to jail, but if that is the case, be willing to fill up the jail because I had to go to jail. It might even mean physical death. But if physical death is the price that some must pay to free their children from a life of permanent psychological death, then nothing could be more honorable. 
Don't worry about the persecutions, America. You are going to have that if you stand up for truth and goodness. Oh, that happened throughout my life. As soon as I was converted, I was denied by the disciples at Jerusalem. And then I was later tried for heresy at Jerusalem. Yes, I was beaten at Thessalonica. I was mobbed at Ephesus. I was jailed at Philippi, and I went down to Athens, and I was depressed there. Yes, I was even shipwrecked in Malta, but I'm still going, and I still believe that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only hope of the world. I still believe that in standing up for the gospel of Jesus, nothing in the world is greater. This is the end of life. This is the end of the universe. The end of the universe is not to be happy. The end is not to avoid suffering, but the end of life is to do the will of God, come what may. Oh, America, will you hear that and will you follow that before it is too late? Then I must say one other thing. You know, I said to the church at Corinth that love is the principal thing, and I want to still say that to America. In America, I want you to know that you might move high in the world. You might come to the point that you are mighty eloquent in your speech. You might master the English language. All of your grammar might be perfect. You might move high. You might move with all of the eloquence of an articulate speech. But I want you to realize, America, that it is still true that even if you can speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not love, you are become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Yes, America, you may have the gift of prophecy so that you can understand all mysteries. You may have scientific insights so that you can break out into the storehouse of nature. Yes, America, you might have all of the mysteries and understand them so that you can remove the mountains of material obstacles. You may move all of the mountains that stand before you, but unless you have love, it means nothing. But even more, America, you may give your goods to feed the poor. You might t- tower high in philanthropy. You may give great gifts to the United Appeal. You may give great gifts to your colleges and universities. You may give big money. But if you have not love, it means nothing. Yes, and you may even give your body to be burned. You may even stand up and die life as a martyr. You may stand before the universe as that honorable person who was willing to stand up as a martyr. But even if you do that and you have love, love, it, it means nothing. Yes, America, it is it's possible to, to be self dissent in one, one denial and self-righteous in, in some self-sacrifice. It is poss- possible for one to be generous in, or- in order to feed his ego, and it is possible for one to be pious in order to feed his pride. And so man has the tragic capacity of being able to relegate a, a heightening vice to a tragic, a heightening virtue to a tragic vice. Yes, even if you give your goods to feed the poor and have not love, it means nothing. You may build your, all of your great institutions. You may have all knowledge. You may build your great Harvard and your great Yale. You may have all of your your institutions of learning and all of your PhDs and MAs and ABs, but if you have not love, America, it means nothing. I still want you to know that love is the principal thing in the universe. I want you to know that at the center of life stands love and that it is the most durable power in the world. And if you follow that, America, you will build a great nation. I must get ready to leave now. Timothy to me to deliver this letter, and I must take leave to go to another church. But just before leaving, let, let me say this to you, America. I've said a lot to you about loving. I've said a lot to you about uh, being moral and living noble principles. 
And I know that you often try to do that, but I want to say something to you about the meaning of the gospel. In trying to live up to the high and noble principles of this religion, you often fall short. And I know how you felt sometimes. You tried to, to live up to it and you didn't quite make it. Sometimes you felt that you could do it alone, but the more you tried, the more you discovered that you couldn't do it alone. And I know how you were caught up in the tragic dimensions of sin, both individual and collective. I see how, as you live life on every level of your life, you're confronted with sin, and sometimes you have to cry out as I have to cry out, the good that I would I do not, and the evil that I would not that I do. And then as you try to follow the law of love, you find yourself saying, Oh, wretched man that I am. But you discover somehow that the more you try, the more you discover that you can't do it alone. And oh, you end up in despair. You end up in a tragic state. You feel that you have lost out. Yes, I have been like that. But when I came to that point, when I came to the point of feeling that I couldn't make it alone, when I came to the point of realizing that I was too weak to make it, I discovered something else. I reached out and saw breaking out of eternity into time the powerful dimensions of God's grace. And where sin abounded, grace abounded even more exceedingly. And so I want to say to you, America, reach out. And if you reach far enough, you will discover God's grace. And it is that grace that can lift you from the fatigue of despair to the buoyancy of hope. It is that grace that can lift you from the midnight of sorrow to the daybreak of joy. It is a grace that helps you to see that by the grace of the almighty God, you can live in this world and you can live this life. Can, you can see the face of the Almighty God with all of his eternal principles. In the midst of man's tragic sin, stand God's amazing grace. I must say goodbye to you now. Maybe I will not see you, but I will meet you in God's eternity. May the grace of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit be with you today, tomorrow, and even forever. This is a letter, and now comes the living of it. Let us pray. O oh God, our gracious Heavenly Father, help us to reach out in our lives and see the great principles of life. Help us to see the work and worth of Apostle Paul, who stands at the center of our faith as one of the most noble Christians who stands as a challenge to us in all ages and in all generations, help us to realize at all times the relevance of the gospel in every nation and in every community. In the name and spirit of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen.